about pre-S services, and I will send you that link, and then you can watch it on your own. But we're just starting the presentation part of it now. Sorry about that. <coughs> Pre-S um, came about as an amendment to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, we are required, because of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, to provide 15% of our funds towards pre -ed services for students. This came about in 2014, and we really started working in our program probably about two, a, a year and a half ago to really start um, implementing within our agency. Why is there a need for pre -ed? As much as work as we all do, there's still evidence that shows that our students are still falling behind. Um, youth with disabilities are less likely to graduate from high school attend, complete college, or be employed. So we still have some work to do. And PREAT is based on abilities and capabilities. It's supporting students to gain knowledge and experience and enhance the transition planning and continuum of service that supports that preparation for life. PREAT are based for students, the definition of a student with a disability is a student in a secondary, post-secondary, or recognized education program that the student must be 14 to 21 years old, could be 22 if they're still in high school, and are receiving, have IEP services, are being educated with a 504 or as a person with a disability. Um, you could be a student that neither has a 504 or an IEP, but has a recognized disability and, and uh, wants services. And you would just have to provide medical documentation for that. So that's a little bit different. Um, and these are the five areas that we cover, job exploration counseling, work-based learning experiences, uh, counseling on opportunities for enrollment in post-secondary education and training program, work readiness training, which we like to call those soft skills, um, social and independent living skills, and instructions in self-advocacy. We really want to work with the students on learning their voice and being able to speak up for themselves and understand that they do have a right to participate in choices in their lives. And I'm going to turn this over to Kyla. Um, so as Carrie was mentioning, pre-employment transition services, or pre -ets, um focuses on five core areas, those five services we had just talked about. Um, and for those who got to see the short YouTube video, um, it explained that pre-employment transition services are a continuum of services that DARS has to offer. So we would like to think of it as kind of the first dipping your toe into kind of what DARS has to offer to start the conversation about the world of work um, and start an introduction into careers. Um, one of the first services we like to engage in is doing some job exploration counseling. Um, there, now, obviously, there's lots of ways to go about that. Um, the schools are doing some vocational conversations. Um, I know a number of schools offer vocational electives, whether it's work awareness training or education for employment, those types of things. Um, but outside of that, we like to do some exploration on uh, career interests. Um, so we have a number of different interest inventories and assessments that we can help parse out what students might be interested in. Um, we can look at not only their hobbies and their extracurricular activities, but, and we can tie those into kind of, okay, so you enjoy these things in this realm of your life, would you consider this in a career field as well? Um, a lot of younger students haven't really started thinking in terms of what am I going to do after high school. Um, so starting that conversation and starting to build that bridge from, okay, what do you see yourself doing now versus, and how does that relate to what you might want to do in the future? Um, we also start the conversation about labor markets. So some individuals want very specific jobs, and we want to make sure that they're aware 
um, that, okay, that this specific type of opportunity might not have a lot of career opportunities. Um, there not, might not be a lot of postings or positions available, so it might be a little bit more difficult. Um, so bringing in some information from um, the labor market, using Department of Labor Resources, um, ONET is a great website um, where you can pull a lot of great labor market information about employment trends, um, talking to them about STEM and STEAM related careers because obviously that's a big industry, a big um, number of different careers in those areas. Um, and then a lot of what we try to do in our group is connect these interests with um, people in the field, so bringing in speakers to talk um, about their expectations, about how they got into the field. Um, so I know for a lot of the summer activities, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, a, a lot of our goals are to bring in employers so that students have the opportunity to start engaging um, with the world of work. So that's a little bit of job exploration counseling. Um, yes. And also we work with students where they are. If you're 14, you may not want to know what a labor market inventory is. They're not even interested in that. So we do work with the students on whatever level they are because we need to just start, you know, we may say what a labor market is, but just start making them aware of things and the interest of, of where they are at that point. So we meet the students on what level that they are. But we just want to, pre ed is really about, if you could put in a nutshell, I think, learn about yourself and learn about what you're doing. It's, it's that ex exploration. As Tyler said, that beginning of transition services. And we really do put an emphasis on learning about what's available and who you are. Yes, you can work at Safeway if you want to. That's a great job if you want to, but that's not the only job that could be available to you, those types of things as well, because that's, I think, very, very important. Yeah, and that's a great point, meeting individuals where they're at. Um, so Pre-employment transition services, we have the opportunity to provide more services in a group setting, um, but we can also tailor those to specific individuals. So if we're meeting with 14 and 15 year olds, the conversation is going to be a lot different than um, that of a 18 through 22 year old group. Um, that 18 through 22 year old group might have more experience um, whether it's through school-based work programs or they've had internships or volunteer experience. So the job exploration counseling at 14 might just be, what is work? Um, starting there and having a conversation about what work looks like in their eyes. Um, they probably have very limited experience, so they might only know what their parents do, and that's what work looks like to them. Um, so talking about all the different ways work um, can look. It can be part-time, it can be full-time, it can be seasonal, temporary, all these different types of things. So really breaking it down depending on where that individual is. So a really good point. Um, one of the other services that we're trying to incorporate in pre-employment transition services is that work-based learning experience. So giving individuals the opportunity to enter and be exposed the to the The conference has been muted. Um, so obviously, Work-based learning experiences can be very individualized and be very different for everybody. Um, so they could be anything from an informational interview with an employer. Um, it could be job site tours. It could be a job shadow, so where someone goes in for a day and shadows around an employee just to learn a little bit about what the daily tasks might be, kind of what the expectations of an employee might be. Um, they also get to learn a little bit about the physical endurance and stamina that you would need to work in that type of setting. Um, employer mentoring, so again, we're trying to connect more with employers in the area to have students get the opportunity to um, see what's out there. Um, again, encouraging volunteering opportunities, internships, and potentially before individuals graduating, help, helping to support paid or even unpaid work experiences. Um, those can be very valuable in helping individuals determine not only what they like to do, but also what they don't like to do. Um, and some individuals graduating high school without these opportunities um, don't know those things and can't make educated decisions about what they want to do as their next step. So again, one of the great benefits, I think, of this new pre-employment transition services is this emphasis um, of getting that work experience, whether it's just a volunteer opportunity um, earlier. Yeah, so um, 
the state of Virginia recognized that this is very important, and um, this year our director and commissioner made it uh, February Job Shadow Month. So all the offices across the um, uh, across the Commonwealth worked on coordinating different job shadow opportunities um, for individuals who are in high school um, or edu recognize education programs. Um, out of the Fairfax office, we were able to connect with about um, eight employers in the area. Um, so in February, we did a, a boot camp with students. They came on one of their days off of school. Um, they learned a little bit about job preparedness, so how do you present yourself to an employer. We talked about different questions that are appropriate to ask employers, um, so talking about informational interviewing. So as someone who might be interested in a job, what type of questions would you want to know about that type of work? Um, so we kind of did some role playing in that. We, we talked about some soft skills and um, so individuals know how, like I said, to engage um, in those types of settings. And then one of the other days um, in February, we were able to, um, based on interest, we were able to break those um, students down into small groups and we took them on tours of different job sites in the community. Um, a number of a couple of the employers were very impressed um, by how the students presented themselves. Some of them got opportunities to follow up and volunteer, um, which was a really exciting opportunity. Um, these are things that we're continuing to try and work on definitely at least every year now that we have Job Shadow Month, yeah, but we'll be continuing we'll to um, do smaller scale type things as well throughout the summer. Yeah, we were very successful with the, our initial um, foray into the job shadowing month in February across the state. Um, each office was able to support students. Um, in our Alexandria office, we were able to went to the Hyatt with the students. The Pentagon and the Department of Trans Transportation also hosted students for us for a day. Um, so uh, the students were able to participate in a variety of services, and I'm happy that we were able to support students um, some of the students we support may be students who have multiple disabilities, and they were able to participate, um, which is something um, we were very happy to be able to accommodate those students. Um, so the schools were able to provide some additional support if we needed some additional support for some students. So that worked out very well. Uh, and we are continuing, and this summer we're supporting some students with some paid work experiences. So. Um, and we'll con want to continue to do that. And students who are in college, our goal is that we will be able to assist them with some internships and work experiences related to their chosen field. So those are also some services that we want to provide. Sure, please. You know, I'm sure there's some uh, employers uh, or agencies that may have some trepidation about working with their students with disabilities, and we have to show evidence, and we bring the best Students that we have to provide during those internships um, and make them positive for both the student as well as the employer. Do you? What would you say is the the lane that we keep? What sets our students with disabilities apart from other agencies that are also trying to find internships and employable experiences for other demographics of students? There's something special about our students with disabilities, but what would you say that is? Particularly in making the argument for employers to ultimately hire our students with disabilities. Well, we're always going to go from the side of strength, mm -hmm. what they bring to the table, like anyone would bring to the table. Um, the support's there, they can pre perform the job. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of go from that. We never go from, oh, this is a person with a challenge, but this is what this person brings. And I think the, the, the students that we're supporting as an agency, we're making sure they're prepared. They have the supports in place, you know, so they can be the best candidate possible. You know, and that's how we present it, that anyone we bring to the table and we want to be, uh, you can consider as an employee, you know, we've done a lot of work with them to make sure that they're prepared for the job. So we kind of go from, we always go from strength of what they bring. And, um, and in, some, in some organizations, if, you know, they want an incentive sometimes, you know, there may be some kind of tax break or something like that, but that's not what we're going in with, anything like that. And we're bringing the students in. 
and opportunities. And you'll be surprised at the number of employees who will, and they're like, yeah, let's, let's have the students in for a day and let's give them an opportunity because um, someone in the family, it's very rare that you have a family that doesn't have someone who may have a challenge or a disability in some kind of form. So, um, we've also been trying to tap into resources of the client's family, so if they know a family friend who works in this position, we are trying to tap into those natural resources. Um, because if you know someone with a disability, you're more likely to be more open to working with someone with a disability. Um, our agency has business development managers who are going out into the community and providing education for lots of employers. Um, so disability awareness training um, and just talking not only about the incentives but how individuals with disabilities are not necessarily more like or less employable um, about how they, even though they have a disability, they have a number of strengths and sometimes those strengths are, make them an even better candidate. Um, so we've got individuals out in the community trying to um, engage with employers and educate employers. Um, every year we try to recognize outstanding employers in this area so that other agencies or other businesses and um, companies see that um, these individuals as models of um, disability engagement. So. And that's the beauty of pre-employment services that our entire agency, anyone can participate in mm -hmm. pre-ed. As Tyler said, we have business managers, we have placement counselors, we have employee support specialists that help. So anyone in our agency is responsible for providing these services. For instance, I mentioned the Department of Transportation. I couldn't have gotten an internship without our placement counselor. She has a relationship with the federal government. So we're using all of our internal resources to give these students every opportunity possible. So that's, it's been positive. Yes? So to talk about some of our students with more severe disabilities, I feel like when I observe them, of them volunteering in compared with the gen ed kids who um, say volunteer um, environment. Our kids with severe disabilities care so much about getting it right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those, those gen ed students will just be putting, say in the food pantry, just be putting cans or whatever, where um, our students are really looking at them death by day. They're really putting them in the right place. They do not want to see the chickpeas over, you know, with, with the black beans or something. They really care about getting it right. Thank you. Uh, I feel like that's a real strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a question. So you mentioned the business development manager and the training. That I, I would be interested in maybe say or at a later time to find out what exactly it is, what training do they have, and what exactly is it that they're saying to the potential employers um, based on recent experiences. I've, I've noticed that some employers, even though maybe that business manager is going in to do um, disability awareness training, as you mentioned, I'd really like to know what that is. Yes. I've spoken to a, a cognitive, so George is here, he's a certified cognitive behavioral therapist and a life professional counselor, and talked to him about what about putting together a training for employers because what I've seen recently is when that manager doesn't know how to respond to someone with disabilities, for example, and may exacerbate a situation mm -hmm. instead of stepping back and saying, ooh, that's escalating, I need to step back and let this. So is there a specific training that they go to and when the, the business development manager, and I know what is, what is that the, um, awareness training for the employers and I know the argument many times is, well, we don't want to scare off potential employers with this information, but I think it's better than that they know up front what may be, quote, coming at them and educate them instead of putting both to the employer and the individual with disabilities in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. I think things. Can you just summarize a little bit of her question so that the people online can hear you? If, if I'm understanding you correctly, the question is how is our business developer approaching employers and talking about the disability piece as far as employment? And, and, and to what extent? How in-depth are they really going in that training? Well, 
Well, I know we provide the disability uh, awareness training to employers, and we talk about the different types of disabilities. I don't think there's maybe any specific scenarios that are shared, and that may come more so from if an, if an, if an employee has a job coach who can go in when you're talking about accommodations or coping techniques this person might have. And I think that might be more of a one-on-one -on -one individual conversation with an employer about a specific person once that individual has given you permission to be able to go in and talk about their disability and what their needs might be, support needs might be. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a great, I actually participated in one that we did with Arlington County, and it, we do talk about the different supports, what are our expectations for the employee? Because I think sometimes employers feel like, oh, we don't expect this person to come in and do the job. We think that because someone has a disability, they can come in and ruin my business, and that's not it. So it is a, it's a, a great presentation, but we can definitely get you um, our business developer's name and, and contact number, and you can give her a call. Well, and let's say, too, hypothetically, if you have that, let's say we're in a situation where the job coach is on site, but the job coach is hesitant to take that next, next step to talk to the employer about what we're saying here when it is a one-on-one -on -one situation. But what, what do you do then? Because that, again, when, when the job coach isn't willing to say to the employee, because the person might lose the job, for example, I think this is a trigger, and when you do that, so that you know, it has to be, I think, something that's in a reasonable accommodation always. But that would be what you would have your team. You would have that person's VR counselor, their parents, the job coach, and you put all these things in place. Hopefully you put in place some natural support for that person on the job as well. You know, Betty knows that if I'm looking a certain way that I might need to take five minutes and Betty can come and say, Tyler, take five minutes. Looks like you're getting upset right now. You know, something as simple as that. This is what I'm seeing in in the community oh. now with clients is that that job coach isn't, despite the conversations that are going on between the parent and the student and the job coach, the job coach isn't talking to the employer about what you just said. You know, this is going to trigger that, and so. How do you, is that, I mean, I'm assuming it's part of the job. I just don't know how to get over, what, what do I tell people to get over that barrier because I don't want to be, that parents, we don't want to be talking to the employer, right? No, no, I'm no. not getting to talk to my employer. No, no, we, to no we, And the employers don't want to speak to the parents right. either, which is fair. Mm -hmm. and, and when the, the individual with disabilities advocates for themselves because of that often low expectation, mm -hmm. they're not being heard neither by the job coach nor the employer. So that, I think that's one of the biggest barriers we're encountering. And the fear on the employer's side as well of what am I going, who am I really getting and what's going to happen and how will this affect my business. So just maybe a future discussion group and we could talk about Yeah, talk about we definitely that. would want that, that, that employee to get in contact with their counselor, make sure that their needs are being met because we don't want someone to lose a job because of a simple meeting. And as a VR counselor, I've met with employees. Right. I think we all have, right. you know, when it comes to that. But initially you do want the person to advocate for themselves first. Right. If that doesn't work, then the job coach, and we make a team effort of it. But, yeah. Yeah. I, it's a really good question because it happens. We see this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also plays into the employer's willingness to come to the table and work, and sometimes, um, they won't. and sometimes they won't, which means that sometimes it's not the best setting. Even mm -hmm. if a client enjoys that position, mm -hmm. it's not going to be the best setting because you're always having someone who's not fully in support of you. That's why I take that, that team effort, have we done our due diligence, and sometimes we have to say maybe we need to look for somewhere else because we, we have to ask for reasonable accommodations, but your work environment is important for all of us, so sometimes you may have to look for another work environment. Here's one more. <laughs> Sorry, we are a small group. So I hear what you're saying there too, but it's still not the solution. It's what we can do, but it's not what, what has to be done and how we overcome that barrier. What do we need to do to make that change? 
the other issue that becomes job hopping because you don't want mm -hmm. I get a resume for somebody that wants a job with me that they've been in 17 positions or three in the last year, I question that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why sometimes the, the employees stay at the job longer, even though they're unhappy there, they stick it out until they get another job. Mm -hmm. So. And we, wouldn't be taking yeah. and we would never want someone to, to, mm -hmm. to leave a job and, and not be able to take care of themselves financially. Yeah. But unfortunately, sometimes once you've done your due diligence, that's the next step, and that could be for any of us sometimes. You stay till you can move on to something else. And unfortunately, sometimes we will run into, you worked there 10 years or five years, we get a new manager. Yeah. Yeah. They don't understand disability. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You know, and I worked with someone, I had a similar case like that. He'd been there 10 years. Mm -hmm. He would come to work in the snow, sleet, was never late. Mm -hmm. He got a new manager. He went down to one day a week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we advocated. We did everything we could do. But it got to the point where, as a team, we decided, let's move to something else. And fortunately, he was able to get another job, you know, good benefits, but... You know, we've done our due diligence, but we have to find something else. And unfortunately, that happens. Fortunately, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Okay. Yeah. So thanks for your questions. Yeah. Oh, going back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Counseling on post-secondary education training programs. Um, we want students who are interested in counseling on post-secondary education training who may be interested in maybe community college, a four-year school, um, an accredited training program. We want to provide students with um, information about different op uh, options. If you are interested in school, um, your financial aid options, requesting your accommodations is very different from when you're in high school. When you're in college, your professor is not going to make sure you get your accommodations. That's going to be your responsibility. And sometimes we work with young people who don't do well because they don't know how to advocate for their accommodations. Um, uh, how to connect with uh, post-secondary services. We're doing college tours with students where they will go in and get an opportunity to ask questions from the disability support specialist, um, find out the different options they may have, uh, we're working with students on if you're interested in maybe being an engineer, let's look up the curriculum for an engineer. You know, what do you need? Do you need to make some changes to maybe your current IEP? Is this a reasonable, is this um, a feasible position for you? If not, let's maybe look at a career cluster where maybe it's not engineering, maybe something else. What do you like about engineering? Uh, those different um, type of options for students that we're working on. But the big piece is, um, you know, we work with a lot of young people who may have graduated from a four-year school and they come home and they have a degree and there are no jobs for that particular degree. So we really want to uh, work with students on what's available. Like Tyler was talking about the labor market. Uh, how can you use your skills, uh, those executive functioning skills, working with them on that. Um, Karen Clarkson is our AT specialist, and she works with the students uh, who are college bound with a group on the different types of AT apps that they can use that will help them be more successful in devices. And again, what we like to do on the pre ed side is what all is once someone is in school and they're coming home for the summer, let's help them find an internship that's related to their field. That's an opportunity. Maybe you come home for an internship and realize, I don't like this. Or maybe I need to, maybe I'm interested in another portion of it, or maybe I need to increase my, you know, my college scores or class scores. Maybe I need to change my curriculum a little bit to accommodate what I want to do. Anything you want to add to that? Um, well, first we can take that question. Hey, Jennifer. <laughs> how you doing? Good to see you. Um, so how, once they've actually been high school, and they're in that 18 to 22 where they're still falling under PREA. Yes. We're not in adult VR. How are you connecting with them once they're gone from us? How are you identifying? What, what we're doing? doing for students who are, right now, most of the students that we're working with are 18 to 22, maybe in some of the post-high school programs within the schools. Okay. Um, a lot of them are. 
And what we plan to do with the students who are in college, if they want services, is like we do with them on the VR side. You know, get emails. We we invite them to groups when they're home during the summers, and we just try to keep that connection with them so we can provide services. We would do if we. I have not yet had anyone who's in college yet with Priet. But I would be doing some of the similar things. You know, you send an email, how are you doing, providing some support. These are the activities that we're going to be offering when you're home on break, you know, things like that, to stay in contact with them. And also making it a responsibility for them. You're an adult now. This is your responsibility. You need to stay in contact with us as well, you know. But working with them on that. So what's our responsibility within the school system, whereas – it's always been, okay, well, they're receiving pre ed services in our classes, but as I see them transitioning out, this kid's going to be gone from me now. I'm supposed to switch them over to adult VR. And that's been, let me call guards, let me set up an appointment for you so we can switch you over to that. Way. And it should be a collaborative effort still with the pre ed counselor to help get that done. Okay. You should be, you'll be working with a pre ed counselor if someone's interested in VR. So that would still be a collaborative effort yeah. between the two of you. And it should also, as they're exiting, start to be driven by that client as well. So talking to them about VR, obviously, I know that's in a perfect world, um, <laughs> but maybe having them sit down with you and make that phone call to the VR counselor and say, we'd like to schedule an intake mm-hmm. to start this process yeah. so that they're at least driving that. It's not coming from you, and then the meeting comes together, and they're like, why am I here? Because that happens a lot, too, um, which is good because we obviously want to make sure they're connected, um, but putting that emphasis as much as we can. On as, much as, as much as they are able to do. Exactly. Is able to do. Because Again, some meeting students, them where they are. Meeting them where they are, but making that, like Tyler said, they're another responsibility piece, but meeting them where they are, because we do have some young people that without the collaboration, it's, it's not going to happen. Yes. Let me just stay there for a second. All of those students are just, they're not there yet. Everyone around them is there, though. We've got teachers, we have a transition specialist, we may have representatives that come to meetings, and folks like Jen and I who work in the PRC that talk to parents about this is what's supposed to happen, this is the potential possibility of happening. If we continue to have a student who is not there yet, does that mean all these efforts are for that and we simply can't move forward because we don't have a student who's ready to be collaborative with the organization and doesn't have the skills? Honestly, he's not, he or she may not mature enough, not have those skills to move forward. But still, we need, as a community, we need something else to be put in place to bolster that student. Are you saying it's a student who, what, you're saying a student is not ready yet to make the connections with us or any other agency. Yes. Um, well, we work with young people every day who need additional supports in that way, and we work with their supports. We work with their parents. We work with them, and we do everything in our power to engage them in services. Mm-hmm. We don't just say, oh, this person's never going to call me. Then No, that's not how we work. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to try our best, particularly if we know someone benefits from services, to engage them in services. That's just who we are as an agency. Yeah, we're going to try. And sometimes we try and it doesn't work, but sometimes we plant a seed. And it might be a year later, but you'll get a phone call. Remember, you, I've had a student, remember you came to my class one day. I'm ready for a job now. Or a parent will call you. They'll see you somewhere. Oh, you came to my, you came to my son's school. I think he's ready to work now. And sometimes that happens. But we do our best to to provide the services that um, that we have that can help the students. Yeah. I feel like I had a thought on that, but um, <laughs> I I recently was just contacted by someone who I had met out of school a year ago, and they were not interested in services at the time, and said they didn't want to go through an intake. And I just got an email the other day saying my plans didn't work out. I need some support. So because they knew me, granted, I'm sure they got my contact information from their parent, but still they remembered that I, I was full of support. 
now is a better time for me to engage in this process. And sometimes it's not even students who can't make a phone call. We're still dealing with young people, mm -hmm. teenagers a lot. When I'm done with school, I'm not dealing with any of you people anymore. I'm going to do this on my own. I don't need the support. And sometimes it just takes some time for that young person to realize, I do need some support. And, you know, we're always going from the side of strength. You may need some support that you have a lot to offer. Let's just I always tell them, come in, let me do what I need to do, and then you can say bye to me. Yeah. You know, you know let's work on what you need to work on. Um, so, and I think the part um, that I love about the Prius is that, we, well, as an agency, we've always been into self-advocacy, but this piece is really, you know, we're making a, um, we, because we're including self-advocacy in, in everything, and all five, self-advocacy is in each uh, a core component, because we want the students to start, this is what I'm good at, this is what I can do. I even, like, I did an activity at a school the other day, and the last part of it, Tell me uh, something you're proud about yourself about. You know, so you go around the class, and that's an activity. And some of the students were like, I'm good at video games. I'm like, but tell me something that's good about you. Mm -hmm. So just making them start realizing something that I'm good at. Mm -hmm. And I had one young man when I did this activity. Um, every other student almost says, um, I'll just call him Billy. Mm -hmm. Billy made me feel welcome when I came to school. Billy um, has been a good support to me. And this is a school I support where the young people have a lot of multiple challenges, some emotional challenges, and some behavior challenges. And I told Billy at the end of class, I said, you know, it sounds like to me you're a good friend and people can depend on you. Mm -hmm. So just helping them recognize mm -hmm. this is what I'm good at, this is what I can do, and maybe I need a little help here. So. Is there any way that you can take that, those types of discussions or lessons in the classroom? down to middle, middle schools as well? We only start at 14-year-olds, uh, okay. so yeah, so 14. So what we're kind of doing with middle school maybe is um, we'll do like a presentation mm -hmm. and talk about pre and then once they are coming over to the high schools, mm -hmm. we start working with them in the, like ninth grade. Yeah. And the reason I ask that because, again, in the PRC, when talking to parents, so often even though it's at 14 they're typically freshmen, mm -hmm. um, that they're not taking that co-management skill set or it's not even being developed yet. Mm -hmm. So when they go, we talk about IP meetings, we still talk to parents and we don't even see a young person in that IEP meeting yet. So as far as self-advocacy, we're not seeing the level, well, the level of self-advocacy so that ultimately they can talk to you. Right. But it sounds like it also is an issue for our school systems to push that some more, because clearly you can't do all that by yourself. Yeah. Collaborative among agencies. It's, and it's a free us, it's collaborative between the schools, mm -hmm. the community partners. It's a collaboration. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a question from someone online, um, and you may get to this, so you might want to okay. put it off. Um, just to clarify, I have a 19 year old who has moderate to severe disabilities, but has strong potential to work in a supportive environment. Mm -hmm. He's a hard worker. Do I need to start the intake process again? We tried at 14 as a parent. If so, how? Our school transition coordinator has indicated that this is a new process. Uh, is, this, is, is this for a, an adult VR referral? Well, the student's now 19 and in school. In school. Okay, well, yeah, he could be either either or. He could be PE if he's still in school or VR. But the way to start the process is we're going to really talk, we're going to talk about that, how to connect to services okay. if the person would like to wait. Yeah, and I, I think what might have changed is it sounds like they had tried to apply when they were 14. Um, Prius wasn't around then, so we didn't have these types of services available. Um, so we only had our traditional VR program, vocational rehabilitation. So things have changed now, so yeah. it's yeah. a yeah. great time to restart that conversation and maybe get connected at this point. But we'll talk a little bit more about it. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer, you had a question? Yeah. I know what I'm doing in Arlington, but I don't, I don't know what Fairfax is doing or anybody else. Um, so when you're identifying which students to come into this school and work with, you're saying, I'm going to go into a class, I'm going to teach this lesson on self-advocacy and employment, or I'm going to teach this career exploration lesson. How are you identifying which group of kids you're going into? The school. 
is the school is working with, I know in Arlington, um, the schools are identifying which classes that uh, Keisha's allowed to go into and provide those services. Right now in Fairfax, we're not in the schools. We're providing all of our services after school or in the evening, so we're not in the schools. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. What about private schools, private schools like Bishop O'Connor? They are welcome. We just need to connect with whoever we could. Um, if we try to connect with some of the private schools, but any school is avail is but can benefit from these services. So either a representative from the school can reach out to yes, the school. Yes, yes. Any private contract, any student that's with, that meets that definition of a student with disability, whether it's private, public, is eligible for those services. Not eligible, but can participate in those services, yes. So all we would need is a contact, and we can start from there. They are more than welcome. Yeah. We welcome it. When we were starting this, we were trying to contact, get in contact with so many different schools, but sometimes it's difficult to figure out who to speak with. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's welcome, please. And it is largely dependent on the school. So some school districts are very open to having DARS come in and collaborate on different services during the school day, um, whereas other school districts haven't been as open yet. Um, we're still working on those types of agreements, um, but at this time, yeah, any school that's willing to work with us, we're definitely open to figuring out what services we would be able to provide. Yes. So for us, we pretty much contracted it out through service work, what's going on with my school. There was originally, like last August, it was a curriculum that Keisha was going to come in and do, and that kind of dropped off radar screen, she was, I think we were having trouble because I wanted her working with the population with more significant needs, and I think we were having a hard time matching what curriculum there was to that population, um, and so I had to kind of move into my, my higher incidence classes with that, and if there's a curriculum that's been developed for you to come in and say, well, once a month I'm going to come in and do this lesson, you just identify the population I want to work with. What we try to, what? we're trying to do is adapt all of our curriculum to students who are on whatever level that they're on. Mm -hmm. For instance, when I did the IEP uh, lesson a few weeks ago, the students who were able to read that, mm -hmm. they read it, they filled it out. Those who couldn't, I just did a classroom. We just did it as a, as a group. You know, I did a lot of the talking, and um, the school that I was visiting has uh, a lot of um, it has a good um, student-to-staff ratio, mm -hmm. so we could all do it together. But we are working on, um, we have a workshop coming up where we're going to be working on um, more activities for the students who have more multiple disabilities, mm -hmm. because we know that, that um, we need to address those students to be able to meet them at their level mm -hmm. of learning and match their learning style. So we are working on those curriculums. Uh, we actually have a meeting scheduled for um, in a couple of weeks. So, so I could go and ask for that. Well, I mean, it could be more that you and Keisha can work with, together on that. Um, Keisha's going to be a part of that group. Okay. So I'm certain I'll, you know, I can share this with her when I see her next week. And she can get with you and the two of you. And we're also working with the, I'm, I ask a lot of questions to the teachers. You know, how are you addressing the students' learning needs? Because, you know, we're not teachers, but we're coming in and we're doing these these activities, so I've done classroom observations mm -hmm. and really working with the, the, the teachers and the classroom aides on how are you addressing the students' needs, and that's what we're trying to do, to meet those students' needs. I just want to make sure that outreach goes many of And that's what we're trying to do, and that's what our intention is. Casting a wide net. That's what our intention is. But with service source, when we're you know, we wanted to start with some groups and kind of getting a group and having a really good outcome, mm -hmm. you know, is what we were trying to do with those initial groups. Yeah. And we're also working with our vendors like Service Source and Mailwood on addressing the needs of students who have um, more learning challenges as well. Okay. So when they come to the schools, they can support those group of students as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes? Um, ideally, how often do you try and get into Maybe three times a year, every month? I have a smaller caseload than some of the other counselors, so I'm going to my schools once a week. 
because I only right now am only serving four schools. But generally, I think they try to. I don't. It, I think it depends on how many schools you have. In some districts, we have councils who have 15 schools. So you know they may see those students once a month. Um, so it just depends. Even it's interactions one on one or one in small group or one. In the I have about five students that I see individually, and the other students I see in a group. And those are the students that um, right now need that more one on one support. But just about five. The others are in the group. After school, okay. after school, summers. Okay. Um, so because we're right now still working on logistics and being able to hopefully one day be able to provide those services mm -hmm. in a classroom, we as an agency, as counselors, we are developing activities because we still have to try to reach out to the students. Mm -hmm. You know, that's still our our goal. So, and we'll talk about some summer activities that we're going to be offering, but we have to um, offer those services to the students. Yeah. Is the ultimate long-term goal for your students to have internships or is it to have a full-time job? Our ultimate goal, as far as with the pre-S, with the work experiences, mm -hmm. that we're hoping that every student will always have a work experience that they can put on a resume mm -hmm. when they graduate. But our ultimate goal as an agency is that we assist students who want VR services with one day being able to be competitively integrated, competitively employed, so they can take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. But as for pre as far as with that work experience piece, we're hoping that each student will have an opportunity to have hopefully a paid work experience before they graduate. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Whenever you're working with the school system, is, is the reason say that you can't hypothetically go into Fairfax County Public Schools because you require a mem memorandum of understanding between DARS and Fairfax County Public Schools, or is it site-based with the principal that's making the determination? We're currently working on the memorandum of understanding. Right now with Fairfax County, um, where, do you know where we are with that? <laughs> Cooperative. We're tackling it again this summer to figure out. Um, there's been some language in it that there's been some disagreements about, so it's kind of been going back and forth, and until there's some common ground and that both agencies, or Fairfax County Public Schools and DARS, is able to follow what their guidelines are, um, they said no pre apps in the schools. So, and Fairfax County is an agency, so it's yeah. a local education agency. Yeah. So are they, who are you speaking to? You have to tell me the name. So at what level uh, within Fairfax County Public Schools are you? It's at the appropriate level. Yeah. It's at the yeah. appropriate yeah. level. Yeah. Yeah. Admin, you're not talking, say, to the head of the principal. No, no, no. no. It's so we always have signed our cooperative agreement. And our pre coordinator in Richmond, um, has a DOE liaison, and they're working on it yeah. too, oh, specifically oh, yeah. to address, and it's not just Fairfax County, right. um, to address kind of all the concerns of all the school districts that haven't kind of signed on yet. Yeah. So would it be beneficial if parents were to write to people within the system as well as to say, hey, we heard about this, we heard this presentation, and, and it works for you know, my child, or this sounds really great, and I'd like to does that help at all with your arguments? Do you think if we're very, very polite and, <laughs> and every presentation I've given, I've I've wanted to come from a place of I just want to inform parents of what's out there um, and let them know that the school could be potentially helping provide and connect them to these types of services. So if you are interested in writing, um, I don't think it could do any harm. So I've mm -hmm. encouraged. Um, yeah, if you want to start at your maybe transition representative or if you're you, a case manager. Because our special ed PTA got in, and our special ed PTA got uh, been, uh, are they on, do you think they're on track understanding that they're I think they're aware of pre to some capacity. We're trying to do presentations like this with the ARC and come to a lot of the ARC yeah. webinars as now. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think those that 
that who make decisions are aware, and we're still working with them, and I, I'm hopeful. Yeah. You know, we're, we're going to be we possibly be hopeful that we'll be able, because I think the more services we provide, the more positive outcomes that they'll, that will uh, put a positive spin on it. And we did have an, excuse me, I think you did. And we had an interagency meeting a few weeks ago, and, you know, it was mentioned that everyone, the ETRs, we all broke out in groups, and everyone did say something positive about one of the services. So I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I think it, it's not – a lot of the transition representatives in the schools are very receptive, so they understand the value of these services. It's more or less a logistical thing. Um, that's above kind of all of us at this point. Um, so it's those parties really tackling and figuring out, well, why can't we make progress? But it, we are making progress, so we're still having those conversations, so hopeful. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, like Carrie was saying, we have partnered with a number of our employment service organizations to be able to offer after-school activities, summer activities, things like that. So we are trying to take advantage in some way or another. Yes. In the meantime. Can we have some annual report where that data can be captured and used so that other agencies and parents and all stakeholders can understand how many students have come to your program, how many of them have those job experiences to add oh, to yeah. their resume, how many actually have jobs, how many are in the summer program versus during school program. We have a data guru, Barbara Burkett. Barbara, Bur Barbara Burkett. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we have like a, it comes out quarterly, the number of activities that we provided. So yeah, it's there. Is it on the website? No. Um, um, we'll have to get back to that. <laughs> um, but that's, that's definitely... The, that's the kind of data that yeah, we need yeah. to, make it, to make it a positive thing to show our parents that this is something worthwhile mm -hmm. that you would want to get your child involved in. And speaking of that, as far as Alexandria is concerned, and I'm sure it's the same thing in other areas, that it's just expensive to live, to buy food, to have a car, and so we regularly, Dan and I, and talking to our parents, well, if our kids have a job or have internships, because everyone seems to have an internship for a student with disability, however, they don't have a job. And when it comes to having a job, it's a real low-level job, meaning it doesn't pay a lot, which means they can't afford the $1,300 rent that is in Alexandria. And I'm telling you, that's just for a studio apartment, and that's fairly low, because they run about $1,500 for that. How does that impact the wonderful work that you're doing on your end? Because that, when you're training people for these internships and training them to these future jobs, that's great to work in the safe way, as we talked about earlier. But what I'm finding out is that our kids can get past an internship or even a low-level job so that they can afford rent and they cannot afford the house. Maybe this is a, a good segue to our career pathways. Yeah. Um, Great. Uh, so one of the things we are trying to do <laughs> is provide more information about different career opportunities and training opportunities and exposure to higher paying fields. Um, so we have this program within DARS called CPID, which stands for Career Pathways for Individuals with Disabilities. Um, and again, it's focusing on pathways. So yes, you might start at the bottom, but with some quick training and certifications, you can easily start progressing within that career. Um, our first step under pre-employment transition services is to provide that exposure. So this summer, we're, we'll be offering some academies, um, one or two-day academies in cybersecurity, um, analyst, coding. Um, we'll, there's also a robotics academy in Richmond. Um, but they have to be have to do DR. VR for that. Um, so disregard that one. But <laughs> yeah, um, and that one's in partnership with DBVI. Well, I guess technically they're all in partnership with DBVI because we're both referring clients to these um, opportunities. DBVI is our sister agency. Department for Blind and Visually Impaired. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just throw out acronyms all the time now. <laughs> um, but these. The Cybersecurity Academy is really to give students um, exposure to the field of cybersecurity analysts. So um, they go through real life scenarios um, and they, they work in teams and figure out what they need to do. It's a lot of analyzing paperwork. And again, giving them that exposure, a lot of individuals didn't understand that it was going to be a lot of reading. Um, and 
they kind of, some individuals left and were like, this is exactly what I want to do, and some were like, too much reading for me, um, too much analysis. Um, I, I enjoyed the activity, but it's a full day thing, and they really get exposure. So we started that, was it last year? Last summer. Yes. Um, and we had a professor from, from LSU. I, don't, I forgot. A professor from some college who <laughs> is in cybersecurity and has a number of years Please in cybersecurity started. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, he came up and provided this academy, and we've kind of taken it, taken those materials, and evolved it into kind of something that's a little bit more friendly for individuals with disabilities, um, and we've kind of accommodated it so it. it can reach a little bit more of a wider array. Of and we're also you know. looking at not just the, com the one for the robotics or the fiber security, they're also looking at one for logistics. Mm -hmm. So that could be you know, kind of expanded for those who really don't like to read. Mm -hmm. I don't know all the details of that. That's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to go and uh, observe that. But we are, as an agency for pre-eds and our agency of overall, is looking at career paths because we understand that not only do we want to help our consumers find jobs, we want to help them find jobs where they can live. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and open that door because as I tell the students a lot of times, everyone's not going to college. But it does not mean you can't have a good paying job. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just to follow up on your previous question, mm -hmm. some of that data is collected by the schools. So we do a one year out post graduate follow up survey mm -hmm. where we contact every single student who left the year before. And part of that capture is did they work with the Department of Rehab Services? Do, are they engaged? Are they working? Are they in college? Just so the, the schools have that, and then I'll get to report to the DOC. Like what level of engagement do we have to be on high school? And engaged means either working or in college or some sort of training program. What indicator is that? Mm -hmm. 14. Okay. Yes. I have a question for someone online. If a student in Arlington will be enrolled in the PEP program, PEP for those who don't know, uh, free employment preparedness mm -hmm. program for employment preparedness. Uh, I can never remember. In the fall of 2019, is there an overlay with the free S program or do you have to get the student involved separately? They still they they meet our definition of a student with disability, yes. They can participate. We're working with students that are in that program currently. Was part of the question, do they need to contact us directly, or will the school help set them up with that? Mm -hmm. I think that might be the question. I'm not sure who to contact. So if they're going to class, then we need to talk to the Eagle. Yeah. If you're, I thought the question was, could they participate? I think a little bit. I love it. But they, they can participate, yeah. and they just need to uh, contact representative. They will have our names at the end of this slide too, so you can always contact us directly. If you're not starting this program until next year, but you, when we talk about things going on this summer, if you want to participate in some of these things this summer and want to go ahead and reach out, um, you'll be able to jot that name down and contact us individually to, to get involved. Soft skills. Uh, Rec Redden is trained to develop social skills and independent skills. This is a big one for the young people we support. This, um, I tell them this is a skill that you take with you no matter what you're doing, what job you have. And this is generally, if you don't develop these skills, it's normally what happens to get you fired. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't come to work on time. You don't get along. You're using your cell phone. Uh, you don't have those problem-solving skills. So uh, we... Um, not only are we providing those services when we go into the schools, but we are also contracting out with our vendors to provide some of these services in a group because we realize how important the soft skills are. And, um, and we try to include them in every lesson I do that I, that I uh, have with the students because it is such uh, a major uh, issue for young people. I've had them tell me, I don't like the way the supervisor talks to me. Oh, no, that's, you know, those little things. Uh, or as we tell them that roll out of bed look, you know, you know, we, <laughs> you know, you didn't comb your hair, you didn't, the whole, so we work on a lot of those, those skills with the students because um, I don't think we can talk about them enough. Can I ask a question? If you talk about those skills with them and you see it as being, it's an issue mm -hmm. for some students, 
if those students are still in high school, then do you take your information back to their IEP team with the student to say, maybe we need to adjust the goals on the IEP to address that issue? I have not done that. I was in an IEP with a young lady who came in with that herself. Mm -hmm. She's like, mm -hmm. I need to, to um, comb my hair. Mm -hmm. I need to take care of my things. So what I did when I did a group mm -hmm. is I, number one, um, gave her a lot of verbal praise, encouragement because she brought goals to her IEP, mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. And to kind of go like, so these are some things that you say you want to work on. So not so much that I bring the goals, but that she said she brought them and she invited me to the IEP. When I did my groups with her or met with her, if I met with her individually, then I can continue to work with her on those things because she recognized that these are the things that I need to do. And how, we, how I try to do my groups is not to call anybody out. This is what we need to work on. These are the things that we need to work on. Um, one day I arrived to the group late and I said, oh, what soft skill did Ms. Gilbert not do well today? And they're all like, you were late. You know, so kind of making it relatable. Yes, I was late. I'm sorry. But when you get a job, don't be late like Ms. Gilbert. You know, things like that. So we just try to make it as interactive for the students as possible. So, yeah. I recently had a student who went through a group, and there were some challenges. Um, and just last week I had a phone call with the school, the parents, to kind of, it wasn't an official IEP meeting, but it was the members of his IEP team, um, to talk about, well, I'd like to move on to this next step and some of the challenges we see in order, before moving on to these work experiences or work-based learning um, were X, Y, Z. Um, the school said, well, in his internship in the school system, this is kind of what we do to address that. Um, but next year we're looking at doing an internship off-site, so we're going to need to put something in place based on what you're telling us. And I was like, okay. So they were working. We kind of talked a little bit about it. Um, I think it definitely happens more for individuals where there's obvious challenges, um, having those conversations. When things are going well um, at this point, the feedback's probably not going as smoothly, but um, again, we're learning how to facilitate this program as well. It's brand new. So. Yeah, what I would do if a student, if I rec like if that student brought that, um, the part about her grooming to the team herself, but what we are working with students on is developing those goals, mm -hmm. and that might be something where you would go like, well, you know, we're developing these goals. Maybe this is something you want to bring to your team. This is some things you want to work on. And one of the best um, of our soft skills, one day I was having a group and I asked the student, what do you need to work on? And he has some behavior challenges. He says, I need to work on controlling myself. He said, because, you know, I want a job. And I'm like, that is such, you're self-aware. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, the more you understand about your disability, the more successful you are. So um, we work on that as well, understanding your disability as well. And some more of the workplace um, readiness skills, the use of technology. You know, everyone has an iPhone and uh, the phones, and we talk about the students with that a lot because a lot of jobs now, they make you put them away. Mm -hmm. I know my niece is 16, and her job, like, no, you can't even have it on the floor because kids are so... It's my phone. So we work with them a lot on that as well. And I know Tyler, you need some financial literacy. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about some of the activities, but financial literacy is so important because obviously when you start getting a job, that money is very exciting. Um, what do we do with that money? Yeah. And instructional self-advocacy is another, um, like I said, we run this through every, the, it, it's, it's the core of everything that we're doing the self-advocacy piece, um, making your needs known. I mean, if you have a, and we're talking about students with, with multiple disabilities or challenges, start small. I was I asked a young man the other day because we were talking about making decisions, and he said, well, I, someone else ordered my lunch. I'm like, why didn't you order your lunch? You gave me a funny answer. He said because he had the credit card, which I thought was funny. But <laughs> but I, I saw him at the school yesterday, and he says, well, I'm going to go to Sonic. I said, so, but well, you're going to order your food, right? He's like, yes, I'm going to order my food. 
something small. I mean, we have to reach the students where they are. But if you're used to every time you go out to eat, someone else is ordering for you, we can make small steps, you know? So you could come up with a key phrase to teach our kids when the self-advocacy, again, because they're not being heard by people in the community a lot of times. It would be really helpful because how, I, I, I've been trying to come up with something to tell the daughters when somebody's not listening. If I'm, you're not listening to me, you're having a meltdown. I wish there was something, if anybody here has a, advice, let me know because it's, you know, I almost want to teach them to say, excuse me, just because I have Down syndrome doesn't mean I, you, know, you shouldn't listen to me or something. Mm -hmm. There has to be, because that's the barrier, especially when it's a visible disability that they shut, I, people shut down. Right. Oh, Down syndrome. Yeah. I'm not going to understand anything they say on my answer. You know, they, they, they go to this inner panic mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so we, we, we're working on teaching the students to make their needs known, yeah. to, to realize that they can make decisions. You know, they don't have to agree with everything someone says. I was telling the students, we were talking about the IEP, I said, there's a room of like 10 people in there. You don't want to be a part of it, and they're talking about you. And they're talking about you. So, and I know, and I do have to be respectful that, we have to be respectful that we're dealing with minors. And there could be some parents, for whatever reason, don't want the students to participate right now. I'm like, well, we'll talk to your parents about maybe start you participating soon. And some will say, well, I go at the end. I'm like, well, you, you did go. So you are participating. And there could be some reasons why the parents don't want them there the entire time. And we have to be respectful of that. But start talking to your parents about participating. And I even asked the question, I said, if someone doesn't communicate with their voice, can they still participate? And the class went like, yeah, she has a, a device. I'm like, yeah, you can have a vision board. You can write it down. There's always ways of communicating. So, yeah, I'm just a bit, I'm, I know I'm on a soapbox about that, but that's just, that's my soapbox today. But, anything to that? No. <laughs> you know, you talk about me there. Okay. Who can provide pre -ed? Again, any DARS, counselor, ESS, business development managers, placement counselors, our AT specialists, um, Witchell Wilson provides pre -ed services. We're working with employment service organizations to provide those services, collaborating with the schools. Uh, so anyone can provide pre -ed. What's PE? I'm sorry. What does PE mean? Potentially eligible. Potentially eligible. We have two potentially, potentially eligible. eligible. That's what PE stands uh -huh. for. Potentially eligible for services. Oh. <laughs> um, accessing pre ed services. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone got a copy of the consent form. Mm -hmm. We would need that consent form and a copy of the person's IEP or 504, or documentation from the, the doctor. That's all we need. Um, counselors we offer, if you want to have a meeting, we can have a meeting to talk about services. Um, if we're not going to be meeting with the students in groups or in the schools, um, a lot of times I just talk to parents on the phone. We try to make the, pos uh, the process as easy as possible. And a lot of times I may just have a conversation with the parent and the student on the phone and then um, arrange an activity um, for the student to participate in. So, so that's what we need to start services, to put them on our PE um, services, for PE services. There's no eligibility process, um, process. There is no financial needs assessment. Whatever services we provide, there are no charges. If we work with your student on a work experience this summer and they have a skills instructor, there is no cost. Um, the services um, don't have that financial piece to it. Again, we have two types of cases, the potentially eligible case and the VR case. Students receive free ed services when they have a VR case as well. Is it still a requirement for VR that a student will have participated in minimally one pre ed activity? It's not required, <coughs> but <coughs> you can go directly to VR if you want to, but we're on a wait list. And let's say you go straight to VR, you don't have a pre ed service, you're on a wait list, you can't participate in any summer services because you didn't have that one PE 
activity. So I, I haven't met a student who didn't want to have one service. I mean, because you could lose so many opportunities if you don't have that one service and go on the wait list. Um, so did, did you understand what, what we were talking about with that? Um, if you apply for VR services and you're still in school, we want to provide you at least one pre-activity. It could be self-advocacy. It could be an interest inventory. That way, once you go on our VR wait list, because all of our categories are closed, and we have a wait list for VR services. If you want to participate in PE services, let's say you want um, to participate in a group this summer, if you didn't have that one PE service and you go directly to a wait list, you can't participate. So that way it just means we can still provide you some services while you're on a wait list. But no, you know, we're voluntary anything we do. If you want to say no, but most people say no. Yeah. Very. I would ask you to be, you know, designing anything in the future. <laughs> what is the possibility that we're going to open categories anytime in the foreseeable future? You just asked. I can't. Nobody. Okay. But we are bringing people off the wait list, though. We are really, we, yes, we are. I think we. So uh, May 15th, we just brought off everyone uh, who applied for VR before February 28th. Yeah. So we're Category slowly bringing one. people off. Yeah. Um, their mission or goal or that they're striving to get to is hopefully every 90 days bringing off people from Category 1, but obviously it very fluctuates that's, depending on the budget. That's not, yeah. So. That's not in stone. But yeah, the last two months we've pulled people off. Yeah, we have. Budget. We're doing a real good job with that. Did you have a question? Oh. Yeah, we're doing a good job with that. Is that it? That's right. No. No. <laughs> 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 What's required to begin receiving pre -ed? A need for one or more of the five pre -ed, the signed consent form for the parent or guardian, and again, the documentation, IEP, the 504, or documentation from your physician or therapist. Adam, I'm not going anywhere else. Am I doing something wrong here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah our summer activities. Like this is too short. Yeah, go ahead, Simon. What does this one say? Um, okay. Yeah. Where was I? Okay. This is just kind no a recap. So pre apps is really just to enhance, um, expand, fill the gaps. Um, like we said, uh, the intention is to start this early so that we can potentially build up to VR services for individuals who would need that type of level of support. I think the next slide covers that as well. Um, so we're looking to kind of partner not only with community agencies, um, the schools, um, employment service organizations, um, but families as well to provide these types of um, services. Um, so students who are receiving pre s can apply for VR services at any time. I know there was a question a little bit earlier about a student who I think was 19. Um, I think depending on what your plans are, applying for VR might be appropriate around this time. Um, if they're going to be exiting soon or within the next year or two, um, you might want to start thinking about applying to VR services um, because as soon as they're no long, they no longer meet the definition of a student with disability, um, they wouldn't have access to pre pre services. Um, and we did describe that there is a wait list right now for VR. So if you're going to be exiting June 2020, maybe the summer is a good time to get on that wait list. Um, and like we said, if you're in the pre-employment transition program, um, you can still participate in pre-employment transition services while you're on that VR wait list. So, um, yeah, some individuals will never need our, sorry, there's a screen back there. Uh, some individuals will never uh, need VR services um, for whatever reason. Um, so once they've completed whatever service they needed for pre-employment transition services, maybe it was just they were looking for some job exploration counseling. Um, once they get that, they feel confident about being able to make career decisions. Their case can be closed and that can be it. Um, they can come back at a later point and apply for VR services if they want, but it's not necessary that someone go from pre-S pre straight to VR. So. Um, 
you have the decisions of when or if to apply to VR services, obviously driven by the client, but the counselor, family, school should all be having a conversation about kind of where is that individual? Um, will they be in the school system for a number of more years? If so, maybe let's just leave them on pre right now because they're not they don't need anything in VR at this time, um, but it should be a collaborative process and discussion. Um, VR, or the pre-employment transition counselors are looking at at least our data um, to see when individuals are potentially coming up for graduation, and we'll send letters saying, hey, it looks like you might be graduating. Um, contact me so I can facilitate a transition to VR. Um, and we talked about VR can still receive pre -ets as long as they're still a student with disability. So, okay, so this, is fun. Um, this, is, this is helpful, I think. It, it gives a, a brief breakdown of potential flow chart of services, um, starting with uh, potentially eligible and pre-employment transition services. Some individuals don't start there, um, and they start at VR, but like we said, this is potentially um, a good flow chart to follow just for figuring out all the different processes. It can be very confusing. I see our green sign, expertise, competitive integrated employment. Yeah. Um, this slide gives kind of what, a breakdown between the differences between pre-employment transition services and like solely VR services. Um, we found that when CREAS was rolling out that there was a lot of confusion about, okay, what's the difference? Um, and this gives a little bit of a breakdown. So um, individuals who are on a VR caseload can still receive all the pre services as long as they're an SWD or student with disability. Um, but they can also attend uh, WWRC for training. They can do more evaluations. Um, they can look at doing press at WWRC. So that's um, pre-employment readiness for education program. That's a nine-week program. Um, in the VR program, we sit down and we develop what's called an individualized plan for employment where we're talking about what VR services or we're listing the vocational goal. Then we're talking about what services DARS can help provide to assist you towards that goal. Um, situational assessments, so um, having students go out and try jobs with a job coach in the community to assess their skills and their interests in different or areas. Um, Vocational training, so for students who want to go on to vocational training, that's our support in that regards would be a VR service. Um, job development and job placement assistance, that's also um, a VR service. So if you kind of think about it, PE is more general. Mm -hmm. The VR is very individualized. Even though we do provide, we do we can provide PE services individualized, but it's more of, um, I, I, that would be the best way to explain it. And in VR, there are things that we can, um, if you are financially eligible, we can pay for or support, transportation, um, the assistance with college, those different types of things. And it's just more of an individualized service. Yeah. More one-on-one -on -one individualized, yes. Yeah. So Tyler, who's helping the person write the resume to, and fill out the app, sometimes online application or in store in wherever application? For just in general? For, for jobs. Yeah. I need, I need a resume, and I need to update my resume, or I need to have two resumes, one because of the mm -hmm. Good question. So um, each office has um, a number of different programs like job clubs and things like that where student or individuals, whether they're students or adults, can participate to work on those types of things. But I also sit down with individuals and draft some resumes. We have um, employment support specialists in each of our office who um, schedule one-on-one -on -one times to write resumes. And they do just that. So they ask, okay, what types of jobs are you applying to? Um, they'll tailor the resume specifically to, or help, again, it's all about building the individual skills. So they'll help guide them through writing their own resume, um, or maybe help draft a template and help them fill that in on themselves again. So they're building that own skill. Sometimes we even have, um of a resume workshop mm -hmm. at the offices sometimes. So 
person can still be a high school student and then you could actually receive PE and VR services all three at the same time? If you open a VR case, um, yeah, and you're off the wait list, yes. Because PE and VR are our two different types of services, but pre eds are the services. So whether you're VR or PE and you meet the definition of a student with a disability, you can receive those pre ed services. You know, there aren't any pre ed students. There are pre ed services. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And I'm just trying to figure out about the resume, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that if you're a ninth grader at T.C. Williams High School, mm -hmm. surely somebody should be working with you to create a resume. Probably on your vocational classes. And even in right. SPE, we right. may not sit down. We would do, like, this is what a resume should look mm -hmm. like. And we have virtual job shadow where we could even sit down and do if you don't have skills, a functional resume. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you know we could even do as a PE, as a class activity. Yeah, one of my yes. pre activities has been just talking about what is a resume, what information is important to include on a resume, um, and then one of their homework assignments, whether it happens or not, is them drafting kind of what they would put on their own resume. Um, and it's typically very introductory because, again, I'm working with the younger age population right now. So, so is it that the high school staff calls you to come to the high school to do classwork with the students? Not my high school. Yes, TC is uh, Keisha and April. Hammond are the counselors at TC, and TC has been open to services. It's, it's not an issue with um, being able to provide services yeah. there. I think they even have had a service source group there as well. I think they did too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, so, yeah. TC has so, always been, and we've always supported TC's um, initiative with JobLink. Uh, have provided job coaches for those students for years in the summer. So, oh God, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're aging ourselves. That should be high for them to have employment after the summer. Yeah. Potentially. <laughs> we, hope. we hope. Yeah. We hope. We hope. Again, this is our first year offering all these summer yeah. services, yeah. so we're but excited to see. Yeah. Like, I, I, my assumption is that if you have a coach that's helping you, that puts you ahead of the pack. That puts you so that you've been practicing these services, you're mastering skills, you have support. And I think some of the students yeah. who do the job link piece at TC also do the project search piece. So they're getting the summer support, they're getting the project search support. So they're in a good place. They're, you know, they're building on skills. They're stacking those skills. So yes. Mm -hmm. So April and Keisha have been doing a really good job with that. So yeah. Um, yes, young girl. And, and TC ninth grade, when they don't really do anything during the summertime, is it supposed to be the school offering? If you have any uh, summer programs for them, then they have to go through all this to be eligible, or they can just, you know, they can. But yes, this is what is offered in the summer. Yeah, we're offering summer activities. You don't have to be in VR or PE. Or they would have to have a they would have to have a PE case type, yes. Okay. In order to do the summer activities that we're going to be offering. So in ninth grade, they should have one already. If, yeah. they should have been exposed to it, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. So they need to check and see if it's that. Yeah. Yeah, and if you want to, you can you can give me your your son or daughter's name, and I can let you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what we would want to tell parents as working with ACPS mm -hmm. is that as a ninth grader, we want we meaning PRC, or that the school system itself would want all of our ninth graders to be signed up for PE. You would behoove them to be it signed would, up. To, for to at least meet with the, meet with their coordinate with Keisha and their representatives to engage in that service. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely we want the so, students to be exposed. And we should not wait for someone who is on ACP as staff. We should tell them to go straight to April Hammond. Or Keisha. Keisha. They can. And then make that happen. They can and then if there's if there are um, so, if, if they think have things in place already where generally I know that Keisha works with Jim and Angela. Yeah, yeah. They work with Jim and Angela so if the parent hasn't talked to Jim and Angela Keisha and April will, will communicate with them because we all do want to be on the same page. And, you know, you know, the parent calls and then Jim and Angela are trying to get the referral when the parent is already called. So then Keisha would be in contact or April would be in contact with, with the, the, the ETRs, which are Jim and Angela. Because we want to, like I said, coordinate together because it's a collaboration. Yes. So then we start a problem with MOU is the definition of all. 
and the school system really has trouble with that. Um, all of, I certainly know we all did because we talked about ourselves. <laughs> um, we wanted to say we will refer students who we think can benefit from these services, knowing there's not enough hours in the day and not enough money to go all the way around to all. And all will never. And when we say let the parents know about the services, the it will. I want parents to know about it. We do want the parents to know. But parents will weed themselves out. Students will weed themselves out. There's no way that if it's 109th graders that we're going to get 109th graders. We're not. That's probably not going to happen. But do we want those 109th graders to know about us? Yes. And so we're still waiting on the brochure. Yes. Because what was going to happen was STARS was going to make a brochure, mm -hmm. and then every single IEP, meaning every single 504, that happens in that school, when we hand you your parental rights, here's your DARS brochure. You need to know this exists. Mm -hmm. So right now we're just waiting on the brochure. So I, I guess following up on that, you know you know how broad the spectrum that Annandale is in terms of the, um, I've actually done. never been to Annadale because we're not allowed to come in and do the PE <laughs> services. So, I, guess, so. <laughs> I was wondering, so would I, I like you say, I guess we'll, we'll meet ourselves out. Would I just be in a position when I do my newsletter to say, you know, all all parents are encouraged to contact to contact you, and then and well, then, maybe what we could do one night is have, a, if possible, have find a facility where we can just. Have a back to school night and meet with parents. That would be awesome. I mean, and just meet with parents. If I mean, I know we can't provide the services there during the day, but yeah. maybe we'd be able to come in an afternoon and, and I could have a meeting with parents and we could talk about it. Versus maybe we could start doing some things like that at some of the schools where we're not allowed yeah. to go into. Yes. We had a meeting with Tyler a few weeks back, and Tyler, you gave us a really nice handout about creative services that we shared with our staff. Okay? Yeah. I sent it out to everyone. <laughs> That's great. Fairfax County Public School sent that out to everyone, too. Yeah. Uh, we've been getting calls. Um, yeah, so that's something similar. And I feel like, like today, to you'll tell someone, you're a parent, you'll tell another parent. The word will get out. That's why we kind of wanted to do this, mm -hmm. because the number of students that we're serving from Fairfax County, I feel, is underserved. Mm -hmm. We want to increase that. But I've, I've been getting a lot of emails and phone calls saying, I got this flyer from my ETR saying yada, yada, yada. So, yes, that's been helpful. Maybe. Almost too helpful. <laughs> Our Prius counselor position is vacant right now, so I'm covering. So uh, I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. Prius in the order of selection, we kind of already talked about that with Jennifer's question. Um, if you're a student with a disability and you receive one pre-ed activity while you're on the wait list, you can receive pre-ed services. When do we end pre-ed? They no longer have a need for pre-ed. They're no longer interested in receiving services, or they no longer meet the definition of a student with a disability. If you graduate um, in June, you have no, you're not going to go to college, you're not going to pursue any um, accredited training program, you no longer meet the definition of a student with a disability. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't get VR services, but you will no longer be able to get PE services. This, does that make sense? No, because once you, <laughs> once you are still with a disability, you have it for life. So, but you're not. But the I definition, the definition. That's why we have the VR services. That's when you move to our adult services. We're still going to work with you on your disability um, support needs, um, but you will be considered an adult student. Yeah. We don't go away. I mean, I had a client. I had a client that was 79. We don't go anywhere. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah, and that's just the language of the law, yeah. the definition is. The definition is, yeah. Um, the following employment, ESOs are working with us to provide um, uh, pre-ed services. We're working with Dead Lake Service Source, the Choice Group, and Melwood. Um, the Career Supports is a vendor, but they're just doing a pilot program right now. But I'm, I'm anticipating that they're going to be providing some services in the Northern Virginia area as well. And we're doing career exploration, work-based learning activities, individual and group work experiences, work-based readiness training. Uh, service just came on board to do travel training. 
Um, again, like I said, college students, we want to assist them with um, um, work-based active or work experience in their chosen field. Um, those, you know, the group activities that we're doing, um, the work-based learning activities, we're doing quite a bit of those. If a student is interested, we could um, do job shadowing, we could do informational interviews, we could do work tours. These are things that we could do individually with the students. Um, so um, there are a number of services that we could provide for the students. Any questions about that? I like the two-day tryout, job tryout that we have available. I think that that's great because everyone's not quite ready yet for a work experience. Um, but we can start working with students. As I said, the students that I'm supporting right now um, are students who have um, some emotional challenges, behavior challenges. So my goal this year is we're going to identify students who could participate next year, include that in their IEP because they attend school year-round and work with their team so they can be prepared for next summer. So, all right, these are the activities that I'm going to be having out of the Alexandria area for students this summer. I'm looking at working with students because our vending services are only for students who are 16 years old and older. Um, so the students who are 14 and 15, we provide services in-house for those students. Um, so my groups are catered to those students who need an introduction to work. What is work? What is getting there on time? What does it mean to have a job? What does time management mean? What does appropriate dress mean? What, why do I want a job? I mean a basic group. It's going to be from 10 to 2. Um, we're going to do, um, we're going to we'll have games, videos, and interactive group activities and we will provide the students with a pizza for lunch. Um, and then the second day, we're going to do a work-based tour with the students, and um, they're going to meet with an employer excuse me, <coughs> and learn about what's expected for an entry-level position, and then we will allow the students to um, purchase lunch. We're hoping to go to Wagmans. I know your group went last year. We're hoping to go to Wagmans because Wagmans has a lot of jobs. It's a great place to learn about entry-level work, and it would be a great place to have lunch. <laughs> a great place to have lunch. <laughs> and then on August the 8th, I'm going to do how to access your community. Just help the students learn more about community resources, ADA regarding public transportation, how to apply for a reduced fare card, and I'm going to try to get a speaker to come in and talk to the students, um, someone who works um, maybe an ENT, a fireman, a policeman, in that, in that area because most students are interested. So they will learn about if I need to call 911 and I have a disability, how would I do that? How, how would I access services? Or if you know, learn about the difference with transportation. If you have metro access, you could have someone that rides with you. Just more awareness about what's out there for them. So those are my two activities. <coughs> okay. And these are Keisha's activities. She's going to be doing um, offering groups at TC this summer at uh, the PEP program. And um, on Mondays and Wednesdays in July, she's going to be doing a work readiness group at the Sequoia building. And Keisha's information is on the flyer as well. So if you're in the Arlington or, or Alexandria City, you can give her a call and get more specific. And Tyler, there you go. And then, yeah, so Fairfax, we talked about some of the things that we would be doing out of our office. Again, if you're a student in this area, we can talk about you going to other offices, but this is kind of convenient based on where you're generally located. Um, but we're working with one of our local banks by our office to do a lesson on uh, financial literacy. So how do you start a bank account? What's the importance of having a bank account? Um, and building on kind of some financial literacy skills. So, and then another two-day workshop we're going to be doing is uh, career exploration, so vocational skills, but also looking at career values. So a lot of times we just focus on those interests, but what do we value in a work setting? 
um, and how can we find jobs that meet both our interests and our values. Um, again, talking about what lessons on labor markets, so that workshop kind of ties in all of that information um, and inter exposing students to uh, resources where they can start looking at this information themselves. Um, panel of employers to discuss their expectations. Again, for a lot of younger students, they've never met with an employer. They don't know anything about the world of work. So having that opportunity to hear from employers and be able to ask some first impression questions. Um, and then out of the DARS Fairfax office, there will be a college prep series. So for individuals who are transitioning out of high school and going to a four-year college, NOVA, any sort of post-secondary education program, I, I say that would be a helpful uh, workshop to attend. Um, our assistive technology specialist goes over lots of ways to manage not only your time, um, but also stress and how to be more efficient with your scheduling and things like that. Um, it's a big self-advocacy thing too, so putting the emphasis more on you being responsible for that work instead of the teachers in your high school. Um, we'll have a job club over the summer, again, just going over some introductory job readiness. So that's a three-day workshop, I think July 8th, 9th, and 10th, um, if that's the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and again, going and everything from what employer expectations are, how to dress to impress, um, it, what does the ADA say, how do I disclose that I have a disability, when should I disclose that I have a disability those types of things. And we talked about, um, or I mentioned the Cybersecurity Analyst Exploration Academy. Um, that will be on July 11th. July 11th. Yes. Um, and that will be in the DARS Fairfax office. Uh, the Coding Academy will be, there's one being offered in Fredericksburg, but there will also be one in um, the Oakton Service Source office as well. Yeah, that's how I said if any of these activities um, you think you know a student would like to participate? We're going to have our contact information, and, and it doesn't matter which office they're from. If let's say a student is in Fairfax and they want to come to the Alexandria office and participate in my basic group, they're welcomed. Mm -hmm. um, we're all the same district, we're all the same agency, so that will not be a problem. Um, we are a big team. So, how do you get on the mailing list for? Uh, as a parent, I submitted information for my son for Priya, but I've yet to get any email or anything. What's your name, please? Uh, my name is Meg Grattan. Mm. Uh, I live in Arlington, so okay. I live in Arlington, so yeah. email me from her, but I've not gotten any information from the teacher. Okay. A lot of these have just been finalized, yeah. too. So they have. They have. Like, 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 have like this week. week. Okay, definitely. I, will, yeah, I haven't sent this out to my case. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, we didn't know about this. Yeah, we just did. We just did. Right. Yeah, we just got them together this week, all of us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we wanted to make sure that we had it when we came here. And we're going to talk about this later, yeah. this one. Even, yeah, the services through our vendors were just recently finalized. There were conversations about what they would be doing, um, but dates and locations have just literally been finalized, I think, last Friday. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure you got it. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure. Yeah, it's out there actually. Oh, okay. The, 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 the service source flyer, they're going to be doing summer groups for a week for students. Um, the, the classes are not filled yet. So if you have a young person that's 16, you think would benefit from these groups, we really do want to get them filled. West Potomac has no one. So please help us. What's the format? Is the can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so it, it'll be small group setting, um, and it's it's an abbreviated, for, oh, it's kind of a condensed version because they are doing it one week and it's a longer period of time. Um, Tia, uh, Sky just went through the nine-week program. It's the same idea, um, just condensed to one week because we know people are going on vacations. Um, so the first, they'll be going all over all five categories of pre Um but they start off with some introductory career exploration, job exploration, talking about careers. They do an interest assessment. Um, they move on to talking about some workplace readiness skills, and I think that's a good portion of it. Um, there was a panel 
I know about post-secondary education as well at one of the lessons. So individuals from NOVA, um, WWRC, well, DARS talked about WWRC, the Wilson Workforce Center. Um, they talked about doing a, a similar panel as well, but inviting maybe um, like Job Corps, um, someone from adult and community education to talk about those types of programs as well. Um, so that kind of fills up all the different types of activities. And the the Arlington group has no one either. I just got I got an update from Lauren before we came, and none of the groups are filled. But West Potomac doesn't have any students so far, and Arlington didn't have any students so far. Yeah, and no. they are going to cap around ten just to make sure that they have the staff available to provide and more or close attention yeah, to all the students. Do the Andrews students want to go to the Arlington? No. They will not drive. <laughs> we have a problem with that. Mm, they yeah. It's a cool building. Yeah, that's not just an issue with Alexandria. That, that can be an issue, yeah. People feel comfortable in their own area. Transportation, family sections provide transportation. Yes. Yes. Now, if a student is close enough and could be travel trained to a site, that is something that we could do. Um, we would be able to, you know, maybe if the counselor or had the time could facilitate that travel training piece and we could pay the initial fee for them to learn how to get there. Um, but otherwise, um, they would have to get there on their own. And what about uh, with the, the Medicaid funding, if they have a Medicaid waiver, could they potentially use transportation under 21? Now that would be a question for the coordinator. I, I don't know if Medicaid would pay for that or not. If they if they could, if they would pay for that, that would be great. Or or Metro Access. I thought sometimes Medicaid was like if it wasn't going to a work site. Has that changed? Me? I know there are certain instances where there are some people that are being driven to a work site. And under some of the Medicaid waivers, uh, the non-medical transportation works. So it's right? Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Oh, okay. um, but under, when they're under 21, if it's the PCC plus waiver, not only that every student can see there, I don't know how that works. Oh, works. You just thought, yeah, yeah. 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 Y
Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.